Welcome to Transmission, a monthly show about the most impactful posts from our Meteor.js forums. My name is Paul Dowman, founder at OKGrow, OK and each month I am joined by Sashko Stubilo and other guests from the Meteor Development Group. Please note the contents of this show are the sole opinions of their authors. This show is sponsored by Meteor Galaxy Hosting, a containerized cloud service specifically designed and engineered for Meteor app deployment. Learn more at meteor.com slash galaxy. This show is also sponsored by OKGrow, OK an official Meteor Prime consulting partner building full stack web and mobile apps. Learn more at okgrow.com. Welcome to transmission number 15. I'm Paul Dowman. I'm the founder of OKGrow, OK where we help clients build great apps with Meteor. And I'm joined by today, uh, Taya from the Meteor Development Group. Hi, Taya. Thanks for joining hey. us. <laughs> and we're going to have Sashko here too. So we're starting out with Taya. So Taya, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody that hasn't um, seen you over in the forums, which probably is where most people would have. Mm -hmm. Tell us, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Taya. Um, I work at a Meteor mostly on um, community programs and developer relations. Um, I'm working a lot on Apollo. Um, who've been very busy planning GraphQL Summit lately, <laughs> but um, also really interested in helping um, the Meteor community uh, figure out how to get more involved with the project. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I have pretty good background in open source um, communities working previously at Docker um, on a similar, similar set of uh, responsibilities. Um, so it's been really great to work with such a large project as Meteor. Um, yeah. Awesome. And since you've come on board, there have been so many things happening with community involvement. It's really a totally different world. So yeah, it's, it's really, it, uh, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with what's happening there. So that's what the show is all about, uh, <laughs> the community. So let's, let's start with that. So um, on the forums recently, there was a really great thread that was started by Ramez who is the same person who started the thread about forking Meteor that we talked about last time. So uh, I think this is an awesome positive direction and Ramez is helping to push that discussion forward still. He's been really active in there. So um, maybe can you summarize for us what what's happening just in general with, with community helping out? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely still a situation that's in flux. Um, I think we're doing a lot of thinking here at Meteor um, and really the community too has been doing a lot of thinking for themselves, which is awesome because this is like a larger, trickier problem than just one person can figure out. Um, but uh, essentially what's really clear to us is that um, we need to have a clearer way for people to get involved. I think there are a lot of people um, who just because of historically the way the project has been run um, you know, have specific issues that they want taken care of um, or new features that they want built. Um, and it's difficult, you know, as an open source user to tr make that tr transition into a contributor. And I think one of the first ways that, you know, we as project maintainers can do that is really better document that process. I think that um, Tom and Zoll... The, the um, process of contributing, you mean? Yeah, yeah of contributing yeah. to Meteor. Yeah. I think yeah. Tom and Zoll um, made really great headway against that um, with better uh, building out the issue triage process, um, yeah. which they documented recently, and also the docs maintain uh, maintenance process as well. Um, but, you know, when you kind of take a look at that, um, you think about it from the contributor perspective of, like, okay, what do, you know, like, what's the first step? This is before I even, you know, identified necessarily a particular issue um, or feature. Um, how do I know how this project is structured? Like who makes decisions? How people graduate from just filing an issue to helping triage that issue, to helping review PRs, to, right. you know, having a decision on what PRs are merged and which aren't. Um, and so I think uh, one of the first things that we can do and this is something I'm actively working on right now and a little bit slower than I would like 
too, just because event planning is really a big thing. Yeah, um, but I'm really excited to kind of um, like put some time away to properly document um, the process as it is right now. Um, and I had a really great conversation with Ben actually just today where we looked at a little bit of, you know, even in our existing process where there are gaps where it's not clear and not really objective, like how people get from, for example, like triaging issues to then like joining, for example, like the issue club um, that is currently running weekly um, with some of our core um, or, you know, most active contributors to the project. Um, and so I think that's really the first step. Um, I think that may feel like not quite enough for people right now. Um, but one thing that I've learned a lot um, with working with many open source communities is that you really have to do things incrementally. Um, and one of the most important things too is just like get everyone really used to a particular contribution workflow um, because what allows open source uh, communities to scale and you know, Meteor is a huge code base um, with we hope more and more people contributing to it um, is having very clear guidelines that are really followed each and every time. Otherwise, it kind of can just be a little bit of a jungle and that's when, you know, um, like difficult situations can arise where there's no clear resolution, which yeah. is, you know, the most difficult thing to overcome, I think, in an open source project. Yeah. So my first effort here is both documenting um, a clearer process and a more refined process for contributing to Meteor Core, um, sorry, Meteor and Meteor, um, and then also uh, making it clearer, like how people can become maintainers of community packages, which, you know, will is, is basically, I think we're, what we're thinking about it right now is that for everything that's currently within Meteor that people hope to break out into um, a community package, which really requires the code to be moved um, into its own repo um, before, like, you know, we're not really quite sure what the plan is with NPM right now, um, but that's as it is today and um, what would have to happen. And um, I think the most important thing is, I mean, that's still Meteor, Meteor, like core code, um, and people still need to go through the contribution process to contributing to Meteor itself before they can advocate for code coming out of Meteor and being a community maintainer for that. But yeah. once that does happen, you know, you have more advanced privileges as a community package maintainer and ultimately like like Mitar, um, who's managing Blaze right now, doing a really awesome job at that. Um, you know, you have a little bit more uh, decision making power in that place. And I guess the kind of philosophy here is like really demonstrating your ongoing commitment and capacity to maintaining these pieces. Um, because it's really important for all yeah. the people who depend on the code that um, you're maintaining that we like, you know, the community itself has full confidence in these um, community maintainers. Yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine if you have churn among the people maintaining the project, that's difficult. I mean, software being the way it is, you have to you have to really yeah. get to know the code base well. It takes, it takes time for someone to come on a large code base and really understand the implications of every PR that they merge and every change that they make. So, yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I would imagine to get to know the the types of community contributions that come in as well. So the longer the same person is is doing it, the better. Um, mm -hmm. And and absolutely. Uh, also to be clear, so because you mentioned Blaze, to be clear for anyone that that um, missed this, Blaze is now its own repo and is uh, being run by Mitar. And so. Um, Let's say for the example of Blaze, um, what does that mean? So, so what is what is um, what does Mitar do? What does MDG do? And um, you know, who, what else? What are the other levels of involvement of other people? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, I would say, and, and I'm just going to be totally clear that as far as like the technological um, and day-to-day -day tech workflow of maintaining Blaze. I'm not the best person to describe that um, just because I have not been able to set aside time to dig that deeply and don't want to represent information that I'm not, not really that privy to. So I would I would actually 
totally. Um, it would be really awesome if Mitar could, you know, write a blog post uh, to talk about all of this stuff. <laughs> Maybe we can get but, him on um, next time. What? Maybe we can get oh, him on here. Oh, that would here. be awesome. Would yeah, be I mean, only if he wants to. But um, I think he's been um, doing a really great job, not only you know figuring out like what people want out of um, the project, but a whole other you know aspect to project maintenance, which is really important, is marketing it. Um, as you know, something that people should use um, and contribute to if they want to. Uh, that's like one of the biggest pieces of open source maintenance that yeah. some people miss out on. He's um, he's super active in the forums. Yeah. So yeah, super awesome. active in the forums. He's created his own Slack group. Um, I believe um, I'm not really quite sure what the exact status of it is, but he's created like an entire website dedicated to Blaze. Um, so, and, and they have their own logo, which is super awesome. <laughs> I just saw that the other day. Yeah. Um, and so I think like he's definitely one of our first community maintainers and um, it's really been great to work with him to really figure out like what, you know, what does this look like? How does this feel like? How do we get to that point with um, like contributor to maintainer, you know, responsibility shifts? Um, and so it's been really fun to learn from as well. Um, I would say like right now in the project, what we have, and you know, I don't wanna, I'll just speak to what we have now because I'm still like working on uh, a little bit of a more mature um, project hierarchy that we can put in uh, the contributing documentation. Um, but right now you, you know, submit an issue. Um, you can also, and there have been plenty of people who are just out in the community who've moved from reporting issues of their own to helping reproduce bugs and triage other people's issues, merging issues that are the same thing. That's like one of the like unsung heroic tasks of an open source project of this size. That's yep. really, really important. Um, and like really, once you start doing that, um, it's a really great way to understand like what issues people are having um, and also start to learn about the product itself. Um, is that something so, that, is that something people can contribute to? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have like documentation right now. Um, if you go to the Meteor Media repo and look at the contributing MD file, that process is really well spec'd out. Um, and we welcome anyone who wants to get involved to do that there. Awesome. Um, essentially, yeah. like what happens is we've seen people who have just taken on like uh, this and done a lot of it. Um, and when we see like that kind of, you know, coming week over week um, and triaging issues, we're like, okay, these people are ready to kind of, you know, maybe start reviewing PRs of them um, themselves. And so, oh, we have some music that's happening outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is Friday night. It's Friday night <laughs> yeah. here anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's just about Friday night here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so essentially, like once you kind of demonstrate like your stick to it, or I don't, I'm not going to try to say that again, but I think you get it, <laughs> your, your desire to keep, keep on coming back. Um, then we've like invited those people to, yeah, to help us review PRs, um, figure out like PR readiness for merging um, and do first code review passes. That's definitely like the next level up, but it's also critically important um, and helps Ben like really magnify the amount of work that he can do too, because code reviews are, you know, like very time consuming thing um, when you're doing them right. Um, and so I would say like the code reviewer level it, and it is the next step. These people also have um, influence and in, like, or votes, so to speak, like what gets merged or what's ready to be merged. I think um, right now, one thing that I would say um, that's important for the community to know is like the the easiest way to make sure that your PR is will be in a state that's ready to be merged is to make sure to go through documented PR um, flow that's currently in the contributor MD file, which is like basically you're going to report, you know, what you feel is missing as an issue first and then get buy-in on feature design. Um, and that's like such a crucial uh, first step. It means that by the time your PR is getting reviewed, probably the people in the room will have seen something like it before. Um, and make sure that like you get feedback before you put too much of your own work in. I think like this is something that should be like really emphasized and in every project um, I've been in has been a really critical first step to making a PR that really helps. Um, 
Yeah. And I think like right now, uh, the last level of the hierarchy is still pretty much reserved for um, like MDG employees are the only code committers right now on the media repo. Um, that's not just because we think that we're the most experienced, but also because of some very uh, like technical limitations of our GitHub organization. Um, and so that's basically kind of what it's going to be like for now. But that being said, the people who are helping review and give input onto the existing PRs, I'm just going to name drop Jesse and Lauren, <laughs> who yes. have been putting in a huge amount of work there um, and showing up week over week, actually, um, to take a look at PRs and issues with us, yep. which is like just an amazing level of commitment from them. Um, those are like, yeah, those are our favorite people. This is, not our favorite people, but some of our many, many people. Among my favorite people. Uh, yes, among sure. my favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is amazing. So if you're if you've got a little bit of spare time and you wanna and you're feeling a mm -hmm. little bit ambitious, uh, step one, um, help triage and help triage issues, reproduce bugs. Uh, step two, move up to uh, I forgot what you called it, <laughs> the next like, level. I would say we're working on the name, but right now we're going with reviewer. Move up to reviewer. Mm -hmm. Step three, uh, you know, become famous. <laughs> Put that on your resume. Seriously, <laughs> like, I mean, uh, I, I can't think of a better way to move your career forward than to, than to have contributed and be an active contributor to something like Meteor. So step four, profit. There it is. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That's cool. And, and as far as, like, um, what you mentioned about the, the top level um, being MDG core people, I imagine that as those things move out into sub modules uh, or to their own repos, then that that gets easier. There's a lot more flexibility, yeah. For sure. um, but that that also maybe answers a question that I had uh, that I was going to ask, which is that I think that any successful project needs an opinionated maintainer, project of any sort, um, mm -hmm. but especially for software, um, you you need to know what PRs not to merge, like what features. Maybe you don't even want to have in, in the package or whatever. So, um, and so I, I was going to ask you how involved MDG will be in that. So that that answers it. Um, and and I think I guess the other answer to it is probably when at the point when it does move out to its own um, to its own repo, and uh, you you guys will hopefully select somebody who is I, I have 100% confidence that you guys will select the right people for that. So that's. It's good. Yeah, totally. Like yeah, and I, I also want to say it's like it's definitely you take uh, and I also can't speak for Ben or Tom again, <laughs> but um, you know the the input of the reviewers is so crucial in, in making that decision as well. So it's definitely not like something that you know it's something that um, I just don't want to underwrite the responsibility that those people have. Yep, yep, that's great. Well, I mean, as the confidence of this thing of these of this process goes up. People will file. We'll start filing more issues. I think that was a complaint. Maybe you know I, I don't hear it anymore really. But um, maybe a year ago there was a, there was a complaint that uh, actually about a year ago from now I heard it a lot that that issues and things weren't really people were just talking about oh, I don't bother to file an issue. And I think now that it's clear that that it's worth doing it. That probably makes yeah, absolutely. that that means now that that you need to have more people dealing with them because yeah. the volume of that goes up. So, Yeah, and one thing that Ben said to me the other day, which um, was, I think, worth repeating, uh, among the many things he says that are worth repeating, um, is that uh, don't hesitate to file an issue um, for even an issue that you feel like, oh, maybe I'm the only person that has it. Um, of course, if, you know, add on to another existing issue if you're having the same problem as someone else. But the point is, like, Meteor users encompass such a diverse um, set of use cases and different technologies they're trying to integrate with that it's very likely that the reason that you know you're you're experiencing that issue is because you may be like one of a small group of people experiencing it, and yeah. it's really important for us to hear about it. So I would encourage people to file issues, especially if they have they find interesting edge cases. Cool. Yep. Excellent. And it's also worth noting that there's a really good discussion right now in the forums about uh, what's important for Blaze 2 or whatever it's going to be called. So anyway, the next iterations of Blaze. 
So mm -hmm. go, if you're uh, passionate about Blaze in particular, go check it out. Uh, and if you've got anything else that you're passionate about with Meteor, go and file some issues. Then tri and even better triage. And triage. <laughs> triage the issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, I'm really glad Thanks, to Taya. have been able to talk about this, and I'm sure there are many people on the forum thread that uh, are waiting for me to update them. And don't worry, I will. It's very soon. <laughs> well, you've been you've been pretty active. I mean, I think you guys are doing an amazing job. It's not like for the size of this project. It's not like I wouldn't expect it to happen overnight. So. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Paul. Nice work on that. Thank okay. you. Thanks. I'll go and grab Sashku now. All right. Yeah, that was nice talking to you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sashko, welcome to Transmission, episode number 15 with Sashko Stubilo. How's it going? Good. I'm going great. I'm glad we could get Tay on here. Yeah. Uh, is there anything? Um, while we're still, if, if we are still on topic of community involvement, is there anything uh, technical to talk about? I mean, I think we covered most of it, but. Um, um, you know. I, think, I think we're good. I think the, the social stuff is um, probably the most interesting part right now. Um, although there's definitely, uh, I'm still excited about the idea of, well, first of all, I think the Blaze stuff is really, really cool and um, you know, getting more people involved on the level that people are involved in Blaze is really exciting. Yep. Um, do you have any any um, like thoughts or inside knowledge or opinions about what other packages might be um, next? What other packages might what be other, next? If there's anything else that might happen in the shorter medium term? I think in the shorter medium term, the number one thing that uh, I think would be really easy for people to contribute to. And I think this is not really like uh, a big deal, but it's just um, a lot of the packages that we don't use internally that are build plugins. Um, like recently, Mitar put in a little bit of effort to upgrade CoffeeScript, for example. Um, and so for people who are using, uh, you know, we use we use less, for example, and for people who are using uh, SaaS, although I think that's a community package already, or Stylus or something like that, um, keeping those up to date with newest releases and making sure the build plugins are uh, performant and stuff like that is probably a really uh, great place to start because those are things where it's just a matter of often updating the package and adding some of the new features. Okay, cool. Uh, and actually, I do have one more question before we leave the topic. Um, uh, regarding Blaze and, and NPM, um, I, I may have, I have missed it if anything's happened there, but uh, is... Is the Blaze going to be published to NPM? Yeah, so the the thing there is um, Blaze being published to NPM is a lot more meaningful if some of its dependencies oh, are right. on there as well, because yeah. the main idea is that you'd be able to use it uh, in any project where you can use an NPM package, so not necessarily with the Meteor build system, for example. Um, and so uh, the one thing we're uh, looking at is basically uh, a way to move Meteor core packages, uh, like Tracker is the main example, onto NPM while making it still easy to use them inside of Meteor. Um, the main problem being the multiple loading aspect, right? So you don't want to have like the Tracker Meteor package inside your project mm -hmm. and the NPM package at the same time and have two copies of it. Yeah. Um, and so there are a couple of clever solutions there, um, but we're mostly caught up in this uh, performance stuff right now for 142, and so uh, I think that'll be one of the next things after that. Right, that makes sense. So Blaze depends on some things like, for example, Tracker, and that has to be, that would have to move to NPM as well. Yeah, makes sense. Right, so like the, yeah, there's definitely some, um, some workarounds that could be done to get it on there sooner without that. Um, and so it's up to, you know, Mitar, for example, he wants to do that, but yeah, that but would I, be the most meaningful way to yeah. put it on. I mean, I imagine you wouldn't want to put it on NPM before the average non-Meteor user could could make good use of it, so. Yeah, that's right. Cool, okay. Yeah, personally, I'm really excited. Um, you know, I've, I've always been one of Blaze's biggest fans, um, 
at the company, probably along with like Slava. Uh, he and I used to be really excited about that stuff. So I'm I'm really interested to see where um, both the there's an Apollo Blaze integration being worked on, uh, which I think is going to be really cool, and uh, just if I can, uh, you know, use Blaze in a variety of projects, um, I think that'd be really awesome. Um, yes. This is kind of off topic for what we were planning on talking about, but um, it's it's great for me to see all these conversations reignited about like, you know, what does a Blaze 2 look like? What kinds of improvements should we make? Um, and so I'm, you know, keeping track of all those conversations, although unfortunately I don't have time to contribute any of the code myself, but maybe I can take a vacation one day and <laughs> get on that. <laughs> take a vacation from work and write more code. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, so if anyone is, is interested in that, especially about Blaze, um, check out the forums thread about Blaze too. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on there. Okay, very cool. Um, so in, in other news on the Meteor forums, uh, there's a good thread about Meteor 1.4.2 beta and um, somebody reporting a solid 2x performance improvement in, in the build. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me a bit more about 1.2, uh, 1.4.2? Um, what else is, yeah. what's, what's the big news with that and when, when should we expect it? Yeah. So, um, so Ben is, Ben is mostly working on that and, uh, he's diving really deep into everything and looking at a bunch of profiles from a variety of production apps. So, uh, you know, the easiest one for us is galaxy. Um, so you know, it makes our own team faster to build Galaxy if the build tool is faster. So that's uh, the primary example. And then we're working with a couple of uh, production applications outside of uh, MDG as well to profile their apps and get some contributions going. One thing we've been just super, super excited about is uh, there was a particular pull request that was open recently that uh, improved the speed of CSS minification, um, just like overwhelmingly. Uh, one moment. Let me see if I can find this. I think I recall uh, seeing that. Yeah, I just I really would have wanted to um, credit the person who submitted that. Now I'm just wasting time. I'm searching too. Gosh, but yeah, but I think that pull request that improved CSS. Uh, minification and source maps significantly came as a result of some of the profiling information that uh, we made available in talking to some of the production apps and that was just uh, everyone at the company and the team was super excited to see such a massive performance improvement that uh, you know just came from making the information available and that is the kind of thing that would be awesome to see more of because um, everyone who has uh, a big meteor app Right, can work together, and um, all of these companies have really great engineers that can uh, look at this kind of stuff. And if enough people step up and make one improvement each, then it's going to be a whole other world. Yep. Um, and I think the thing that really excites me about this particular release is that, uh, well, one thing I've been pretty sure of for a while is that the solution to problems in life is not just like you know, switch to Webpack or something like that. Um, like there are so many different uh, potential downsides of that. One is for a lot of people who have code that requires kind of Meteor backwards compatibility features that we've worked so hard on, um, it's not a reality today to move to a different build system. Um, and even for people who have that opportunity, it's not necessarily faster, right? So when you start a new project with something like Webpack, uh, you're super happy because you know it builds super fast, but one of the reasons is that your project is tiny. Um, and as your project gets larger, I've seen you know on Twitter the same complaints that we hear about Meteor's build system about Webpack, like oh my project takes you know this many minutes to build or whatever. Anyway, I'm just really excited that it, this shows that there's so much more to do um, on this system and bringing uh, Meteor's build system up to par with modern JavaScript while keeping the same kind of low configuration approach and like production readiness is really, really cool. Like I'm really excited about uh, Create React App, which is this tool that the React team has been working on to make it really easy to get started with React. Um, 
But the problem with that is if you need to build in certain kind of production features or you need to customize something, you have to eject from that tool, right? They have a special command that puts a bunch of configuration in your project. And, um, and I think the cool thing about Meteor, which makes it still somewhat unique, is you get that low configuration experience all the way into production deployment, depending on your app's requirements, right? Like there's definitely a lot of things that are not easy or possible to get with Meteor, like stuff like code splitting is the classic example. Yep. But I'm really excited to see if, uh, if we can get there. And I think this is a really great first step that shows there's a lot of life left in that tool. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's being worked on. Um, I, and I think like, you know, for new projects, um, you know, we've, we've started a few things. Like for example, we, we have a, uh, we're doing a training course and it's mostly um, uh, GraphQL and React. And it still makes so much sense to start it on foundation of a Meteor app because it's just, it's very easy, it's very quick. And you don't, you don't really run into any limitations. So yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm really excited about it getting incrementally faster. We'd love to see code splitting in the future. So, yeah, I would definitely love to explore some opportunities and I'm curious, uh, you know, if people get this far in the podcast, what they think about um, if it were possible to uh, achieve features like code splitting while maybe removing some of the uh, backwards compatibility stuff in the tool, right? If that would be, if that would be worth it, like if you could do it on a per project basis. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, we, we are currently using Meteor for all of our production apps. Um, and so, you know, we have uh, Galaxy, which is kind of a, an app that was started, I think, in Meteor 1.2 and, um, and has, you know, it's very heavily based on Meteor packages, uh, shares code using, you know, um, Atmosphere and stuff like that. And, um, and then we have our new app, which is Optics, which is for GraphQL tooling, is also built on Meteor, but built using, you know, entirely a module-based architecture. And so, you know, if we could work to improve the performance of the new app um, and like throw off the, uh, the requirements of like the old one, then it might be worth it, you know, depending on the project. Uh, can you help me understand why, uh, why, why backwards compatibility is even a thing? So is it because you're, you're actually sharing the same Meteor tool in your, in your path, uh, no matter which project you have, like it, does it, does it not use something specific to the version that, that you're in? So for example, if you're working on a 1.2 app, um, it, it, was it, is, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Like, uh, how, I don't understand how much of the tool comes from the 1.2 installation and how much of it comes from something common that's in your path. Right. So Meteor, the Meteor tool is run on a completely unique basis for every project. So right. if you're running with Meteor 1.2, you're using actual Meteor 1.2, like the exact same code that you were using a year ago. Right. Okay. Um, but the, the question is like, uh, you know, uh, people would not be very happy, I think, or at least the Galaxy team wouldn't be very happy, I would guess, if we said, you know, you're not allowed to upgrade Meteor anymore in this project. <laughs> like, you're not going to get any performance benefits, like any new features and future versions of Meteor, you don't get those either. Um, so the, the tension there is that, uh, you know, we want people to be able to upgrade to the newest version in their project. And we put in a lot of effort to make that possible because, you know, of course, using the same tool forever is an option. Um, but it's not always a good one, right? For example, like uh, we hope that uh, people can um, upgrade to Meteor 1.4, which will give them uh, Node 4 as the basis of their JavaScript execution, right? And um, that comes with a couple of costs, right? Which you would get in any app that was migrating from uh, Node 0 0.12 to Node 4. But, you know, it would really suck to tell people who are running Meteor 1.2 and say, you're never going to be able to use Node 4 because you simply cannot upgrade your version of Meteor. And one solution to that is also to decouple the versioning of different things, right? So 
the fact that you have to upgrade all of Meteor at once is definitely a big downside and is somewhat being addressed by the fact that you can now upgrade individual packages separately. Yeah. Um, like for example, we published the new version of CoffeeScript I was talking about. And so you can get imports in your CoffeeScript files just by updating the CoffeeScript package and you don't have to update the rest of the Meteor release anymore. Yeah. But for more core stuff like the build tool or the version of Node, um, right now, that's still heavily tied to the particular release you're using. Okay, so I'm still wrapping my head around the backward compatibility thing. Are you saying it's because um, you it still supports old structures, like not using imports? That's right. Okay. That's exactly okay. what I mean. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Backwards compatibility in the sense that if you're starting a new app, you don't care because your old app is using the old version and your new app is using the new version or whatever. But if you have an app that you've been working on for years, uh, you want to be able to upgrade that. And that's what we're okay. doing, right? We've been so the, upgrading the same app through 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. So the, when I think upgrading, I, I guess I was thinking like bringing your everything up to date. But so, yeah, so I mean, you would have to, and, and to be clear, that, that is a pretty painful job to put, to move everything to imports. So, but right. still, I mean, it's still probably, yeah. I think it's worth it in the long term, um, but I'm always a bit, uh, uh, maybe surprise is the wrong word. I am so like you'll see uh, on the on the forums or something, people will say, "Oh, I want to upgrade to Meteor 1.4 or 1.3, but I don't want to rewrite my whole app mm -hmm. with modules." And um, I can understand where people are coming from because we heavily recommended switching to modules because we're very confident that's the right approach because that's where all of the JavaScript community is moving. Um, on the other hand, we put in so much work to make it so that you don't have to do that to upgrade yeah. that uh, it's a bummer that we left that impression for people. So maybe there was a way to communicate that that was like, you know, you can upgrade without rewriting your whole application. Um, but I don't know, given the choice between uh, encouraging people to upgrade to what the rest of the community is doing and not, I definitely think encouraging people to do that was the right choice Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you... If you Google around for code snippets of how to use uh, how to use React or how to use some package for npm, um, they're all going to be using the modern modular approach. So now in, in new versions of Meteor, you can just copy and paste that code right into your app, whereas before you had to think about how does this fit into like my super special Meteor world. Yeah, I, I think it's inevitable for uh, to that you'll have to eventually move to modules for various reasons. NPM or whatever, but I can understand not doing it and especially not doing it right away. I mean, it's, it's a business decision at the end of the day. If everything still works, there's a lot, of, not every project is, uh, has, has the room. Like, I mean, I always tell our clients we need, we need to have like a pretty high percentage, like, I don't know, realistically, at least 10% of over, over a long period of time, at least 10% of, of your effort and budget has to go into keeping things up to date with the rest of the world. Um, it's yeah. called, it's called software rot. It's a really, there's a really great, uh, Wikipedia article about it that I usually link people to, but, um, and yeah, it's easier to do like, that incrementally, yeah. but yeah, the thing is things keep working and they keep working until they stop. So one day you, you realize the one thing that you need to upgrade will require upgrading everything. And then, and that's a really hard way to do it because, um, if you upgrade one thing at a time and something breaks, you know why, but when everything is broken, it's, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So still on the topic of 1.4.2, um, uh, what, what else is new other than the build system? Or um, there's a, a couple of fixes and stuff like that, but that's the main focus is just, uh, only performance. Like cool. we've been talking a lot about Apollo and meteor integration. Um, but when we really looked at what people in the Meteor community were asking for, um, you know, when, when I was like, oh, Apollo and Meteor, people would reply and say, you know, but it's already not that bad. And then I would, you know, and then you would look and see a whole bunch of uh, threads about performance with people having a really bad time. And so we decided the right prioritization was to focus on that first before we do anything else. Because, you know, if you look at the priority list great. of Meteor features, it's like up here and then everything else is like a mile down. Um, and that's the same thing that, uh, you know, the Galaxy team was telling us, for example, is that that's the number one priority above other things. Um, so that's what we're doing. That's great. 
I want to say both though. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, uh, is Apollo integration still planned for, is that still the 1.5 plan? Um, hopefully, I think it depends on, you know, I think part of moving Meteor to a more community oriented model is um, giving it more of a life of its own. So I think, uh, you know, getting Apollo and Meteor integrated is certainly a priority for, for us as a company because these are the two biggest projects we're working on and we want people to be able to use them together because they solve different problems in really complementary ways and we're using them together. Um, on the other hand, there's not a technical blocker for using Apollo with Meteor today, right? In the sense that Meteor is a fully JavaScript compliant, uh, you know, build system, deployment platform, includes an account system that works with Apollo, everything. And then Apollo is something that's been specifically designed so that you can use it with almost any architecture you can imagine. So uh, plenty of people are using them together already, including, you know, like I said, our own applications. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're definitely thinking that we should prioritize what's best for Meteor overall. Um, and then when there are opportunities, um, see how to make that integration better. And like, you know, with the ultimate goal, I think being making it so that when you're using Meteor, it feels like you're no longer hardwired to a specific database. Um, that would be probably the headline goal for a Meteor and Apollo uh, integration is that you can delete your MongoDB database and never see it again. Right. Um, except for accounts being a big thing right now for that. So. Right. Yeah. And like I said before, there have been a lot of efforts. Um, one thing that's been really interesting is um, an Apollo accounts project has popped up. In fact, two of them. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where that goes because there's definitely a question, which is how much value does Meteor accounts specifically bring in the sense that like that exact code base versus the experience of using Meteor accounts, which is you're starting a new application and you can easily add login of various different kinds, easily get the current user, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And so from the point of view of integration packages, I think it's important to be able to build a package that takes advantage of the current login state. So that's definitely one argument towards integrating with the, the Meteor system. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I'm saying is there are a couple of different strategies to get to an account system which is database agnostic. Um, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see which direction it comes from. Is that from migrating the current Meteor account system over to a more generic situation or a different account system will come up that basically replaces all the features and then um, and then it can go from that from that way. Um, yep. But there's a lot okay. of really interesting projects like uh, you know, um, especially if you're starting a new application with GraphQL from the start, there's people working on like GraphQL admin panels, for example, that would replace something like the MongoDB admin panel. Um, so it's interesting, yeah, depending on where you're coming from, which is like uh, you have a, only a Meteor app and um, you're not interested in GraphQL at all versus you're starting a new app from scratch and you're not interested in the the Meteor data system, but you want to use GraphQL or maybe somewhere in the middle, um, there are like different requirements there. Interesting. Yeah, um, I, I know I, I'm, a, I'm like a accounts broken record sometimes. I'm, I'm really, no, but, I, what, I totally but I think agree. like, I think one really important thing is the ubiquity of it in, in Meteor, like the fact that um, accounts are built right into Meteor. It's some, It's like when you call when you call a method or do a publication, it's just, you don't have to do something custom and different. And so if you are um, building a package that other people will use, or if you're using other people's packages, um, authentication is something like you just share a common way of doing it. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I mean, things are, I guess, getting more heterogeneous in the JavaScript world, so. Also to be, no, but yeah, so, no, I, I completely agree with you that that's like really important. Yeah. Um, and to be clear for anyone that, that, that like this wasn't, <laughs> if this wasn't clear, you can right now use Apollo with Meteor and integrate with accounts and it even works with graphical. So you can, you can be the logged in, you can make it so that you are the logged in, um, the currently logged in Meteor user when you go to graphical. So I, I think that integration is all really great right now. There's a little bit of yak shaving that you might 
have to do, but it seems to be getting, um, I'm not sure what the state of it is, but getting something that will be shortly merged. And anyway, it does work. So, so that's good. Yeah, cool. yeah, definitely. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been cool because that's brought in some benefits to Apollo server as well, which is the current uh, HTTP GraphQL server that we're working on. And it's interesting because this one feature that was added there, which is a way to set custom login state for graphical, um, is now something people are using in the the Happy and Koa integrations for Apollo server as well, which are clearly not for Meteor, right? Because Meteor is not using Happy or Koa. But it's cool that this idea of making it easy to be logged in in graphical is expanding to other server frameworks as well. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. So they're, they're just setting the same client side thing in local storage or whatever, and then you become Yeah, so in. basically what you get to do is you get to specify essentially a function that gets called. And so the Meteor version of it is a function that pulls out a token out of local storage. Yeah. Um, but then there's like some other version that like you can pull out a, a Java, uh, JSON web token out okay. of wherever, right. and you can attach it to the request. Um, okay. So yeah, so it's, it's really cool. neat. Like. There's a lot of progress to be made in GraphQL stuff as well that can come from the Meteor integration. Cool. All right, then. Um, speaking of GraphQL, um, subscriptions is something that I've been hearing a lot about recently. So uh, can you tell me a bit about that? What's the state of it? And where are we going next? Yeah, so the really cool thing to me is, uh, you know, we're on the uh, the Meteor community podcast, so I can, I can speak uh, in the Meteor context, which is very exciting to me, is that, um, you know, Meteor for a long time has been moving in the direction of GraphQL-like stuff in the sense that a lot of the stuff that is today in GraphQL was something that was in the Meteor community for a long time, right? And that actually, we can get to that when we talk about Grapher, which I'm really excited. I looked into it a little bit and it seems really, really cool. Um, but basically the idea is like adding schemas to your API with something like simple schema doing nested data fetching with published composite, um, being able to do optimistic UI and identifying objects with Mongo IDs, something that Meteor has had for a long time and GraphQL is also embracing. And then the other way around, uh, GraphQL has been around for a little bit now and GraphQL seems to be excited to move in the Meteor direction as well. So it's kind of like, uh, you might, all, might even say converging a little bit where GraphQL is starting from being super general and Meteor is starting from being super specific and they can meet in the middle, have the best of both worlds. Yeah. Sorry, that was a big introduction. But the point is, in my mind, subscriptions are the first step on that path, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that people love about Meteor is the ability to have uh, reactive data. And uh, subscriptions are uh, the first step to reactive data in GraphQL, which is super, super, super backend agnostic, right? So the idea is you write your GraphQL API the exact same way that you did before, but now you have the ability to rerun certain queries in response to a message. Um, and that means that you know even if you're writing to SQL or a REST API, as long as you have a message bus set up, like over Redis, for example, or even over Mongo, you can have that kind of reactivity feature. Mm -hmm. So. We're trying to be at the forefront of pushing for that technology in GraphQL. Um, so if I understand it right now, basically your your mutation is going to um, is going to invalidate a like a send an invalidation message on a channel or something, and then you basically rerun the whole the whole query. Exactly, and so um, so that's the you know that's why I said it's just one step, um, which is that yeah the subscriptions have a limitation right now, which is that you you get the, a whole chunk of data back, right? So if you have a really big query, it might not be performant to rerun that very often, right? Versus Meteor is all about sending very small patches of data, which can be better in certain cases. And so, uh, you know, subscriptions are a good start. And then the GraphQL community and Facebook, uh, we've talked to them at length about this as well, are really interested in moving forward to something more like GraphQL live queries, which coincidentally require a transport mechanism much more similar to Meteor's, uh, where you send smaller incremental pieces of data rather than the entire result at once. So it'll be interesting to see in the coming maybe year or so how those two technologies can converge and what we can learn from each other, right? Because uh, you know Facebook is coming at it from the perspective of 
if it can't scale, we're not going to do it at all <laughs> because yeah. Facebook has like, you know, a lot of users. <laughs> and um, Meteor was coming at it from the perspective of here's the developer experience we want at all costs yeah. um, sometimes, which means it's easy to write an application that is not efficient. Right. And so I wonder if you can meet in the middle and have both. <laughs> Um, and then it would just be like the best thing ever made, which would be super cool. Very interesting. And so you, you guys have, um, have written it with a, uh, like a, a plugin architecture so that you've got, you can, you could write, um, all kinds of different, um, backends to use for the message bus. So you've got a Redis one you could use, uh, you could, uh, I think you're, you mentioned in your blog article, eventually doing a Mongo and you, you could do, I guess you could do RabbitMQ or whatever you want. Right. Yeah, and that's it's really cool. We we right now have a lot of parallel conversations going on. So like I said, our, our main interest is, you know, we want to use this stuff and we're probably going to use it with something like Mongo because that's what Galaxy is using. Um, and that's probably what the media community is most interested in to start with at least. Um, but our hope is to basically make it like a thing in the community. And so we've talked to a variety of people about an implementation with Postgres triggers RabbitMQ is something I just heard about this morning. Somebody was interested in um, having it work with, there's already a package um, that I was talking to somebody about that's using the Mongo uplog um, that will be later expanded to use Mongo live queries uh, in, in Meteor style. Then there's uh, Postgres triggers. Basically the idea is like, if we can make an architecture that's flexible enough to work with all of these five different sources of messages, then suddenly subscriptions are just like a thing you yep. can use regardless of what you're doing and we've even been thinking of what it would look like to implement it for a rails graphql server right so making it truly an agnostic thing that you can use regardless of what client or server or backend which is really like the main hope of the whole apollo project is just like making it so that uh regardless of your architecture or language you can get a lot of these benefits awesome cool well um like I mentioned, we've we've been using Apollo with Meteor apps, and it's it's good. So we're we're pretty happy with that. Um, you guys are putting on a conference next month, uh, th this month, in two weeks actually, uh, yep. the GraphQL Summit. So I'll be there. We're we're sponsors. We're doing a a, a short training thing there as well. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, that thing is like super duper sold out. It's crazy. Congrats. That's great. Excellent. Congrats to you. <laughs> so yeah. um, the other thing to talk about then is is Grapher. So there's a, there's a Meteor package called Grapher, and there's a, there's some discussion about this in, in the forums as well, and it looks awesome. I was trying to figure out how it works. It looks like it uses methods. I don't think the documentation say that, so I could be wrong. Yeah. But so maybe I should step back and like, what's the what's the purpose of it? What's the, the general so yeah so I you know on the, on the methods thing I actually looked into it and it sorry this is like too detailed maybe but it, apparently it has the ability to use both methods and publications depending on whether or not you want your data to be reactive which All is right, cool. really awesome okay yeah I jumped right into the the <laughs> details too quickly and I forgot to introduce it what it is so it's uh, sort of a GraphQL style um, uh, uh, query manager I guess for a, a way of Retrieving your data in a Meteor app, it's, it's, it's all Meteor, way of retrieving your data in um, like a graph style so you can have joins and things, which has traditionally been like kind of painful in, in Meteor. Um, so you specify this query in a, uh, in a query language that looks very much like GraphQL, and you get it all back either reactive or non-reactive into, into the client side. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So it's it's really really cool. Like the more I look at it, the more I think this is like really awesome. Um, uh, you know, I have one one gripe with it, which I want to get out of the way early, which is it's not actually GraphQL, and it's a really small distinction, which is just like whether or not you use the actual GraphQL query language or they have a custom language that is kind of like a JSON object. And the only the only problem there is just that. Uh, some of the developer tools designed for GraphQL expect that specific language. Other than that, it has uh, almost all the benefits of GraphQL that I can see, right? So uh, much like in vanilla GraphQL, you might call it, you define a schema for your data. And so in Grapher, uh, from what I see, you do that using simple schema. 
which is great because that's what people in the media community have been using for a long time. You get to define links between different kinds of data, which is really cool. Uh, something you do in GraphQL with resolver functions, but they have a very similar concept. Then uh, what you do is you can basically, um, I think you can, uh, ooh, I don't know the exact detail, but basically the idea is then now, now you have this whole description of your data, you can kind of publish it or expose it, they call it in Grapher, which is basically making that data available to the client um, and then from the client, you can uh, specify which of these, these fields you want. So basically starting with a particular model object, you can traverse the links that you've created uh, and then essentially take that query and use it to subscribe to data on the server. So I think depending on how you configure it, you can either fetch that data once with a method or multiple or have it be reactive with the publication. And I've heard there's also a way to hook in external APIs into there in the case where your data is not in Mongo. So I think this is kind of like, um, it's what we would have done if we wanted to get all the benefits of GraphQL in a Meteor app, except still rely on uh, MongoDB and LiveQuery. I think this is like exactly the right approach. Um, the, the main reason that it doesn't work uh, for us and why we didn't take that same approach in Apollo is because we really want to have it be um, A, compatible with the wider community of GraphQL tools mm -hmm. and B, work with a wider variety of backends. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is, you know, if you've been wanting to try out uh, kind of the feeling of, of GraphQL of being able to arbitrarily fetch data and join across different things in your Meteor app, this could be a really great way to do that. Right, or maybe if you've got... Um something that is not scaling and you and you're thinking about moving it to the the method style way of doing things you could you could try this and then you can choose whether it's reactive or not yeah yes. that's true as well cool yeah and i think it's um yeah i think this is kind of a much more you could say it's a more practical approach for for meteor applications where um, apollo is starting out with vanilla graphql uh, which is just http based and then we're trying to move in the direction of more reactivity and stuff like that. Um, and this is just giving you everything at once, but just with with a lot of assumptions baked in, right? Like that you're using Meteor or that you're using MongoDB. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a much more powerful tool, but you know, as long as you fit into a particular type of application. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. So uh, that's I think that's it for the topics that I had. Uh, is there anything else we should cover? Anything I missed in the forums? No, man, this is this is great. So much exciting stuff. I really uh, kind of want to go and check out this grapher thing, and then I want to go and maybe figure out how to put the GraphQL query language over it. That would be awesome. <laughs> we'll see if that works out. Um, but this is cool. Yeah, I'm, we're all a bit uh, a bit stressed out here preparing for this uh, GraphQL summit, which I think is going to be really, really cool, and then we're going to... Uh, all the talks will be up after the thing as well. So that'll awesome. be something you can check out. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. So, um, so yeah, so you meant earlier that the, that it was just our training that sold out, not the whole conference then. I misunderstood. That's right. Okay. So, okay. A great opportunity if you're in San Francisco or able to get there. Uh, it's, it's still not sold out. There you go. Yeah. But we're on the third level of tickets now. So they're more expensive. So sorry. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be awesome. And I'm, maybe I'll get to like peek into the training and maybe I'll learn something. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Sashko. Thanks, Paul. That was cool. Looking forward to talking again next month. Yep, and uh, hopefully I'll see you here at the summit as well. See you in two weeks. All right. All right. See you later. Thanks.